Hey, my name is Caden, and I want to thank you for joining us today. We hope this message inspires you, builds your faith, and gives you perspective to see God is moving in your life. Enjoy the message. Good morning. Welcome to worship on this third Sunday of Advent. And I guess I'm so proud of Kenny and Amber, just so incredibly proud of them giving. Now they're starting their 10th year in Eswatini. Remember, they worshiped back here sitting behind me, and now they're doing such amazing work. Would you thank them one more time for their amazing work? Yeah, they're truly a blessing. Maybe you can greet them after worship. And I uh, thought I'd start by letting you know that uh, our family, the Watts family, expanded this week on Thursday. Uh, my son, my daughter-in-law gave birth to their very first child. Uh, and on uh, Thursday, Nolan Azalea Watts was born, seven pounds, four ounces. And uh, it's my son's first. And he, he gave, his middle name is named after my grandpa who raised me. And so uh, he surprised me with that. So we're, we're all very, very excited about that, and a big shout out to my, to my son. Um, that was just free. It just comes with, uh, you know, the, the package today. I, you, you just needed to know that whether you wanted to or not, so there you go. <laughs> 24 years ago, our family had the amazing opportunity to build our own house uh, so we could put roots here in Cape Girardeau. We found a great lot flat that became this big backyard that hosted many, many football and baseball and soccer games over the years uh, as our boys, David and his brothers, would bring their friends over there. And when we went to build the house, we had a friend, a master builder, construct it for us. Uh, and he discovered one thing as he looked at the topography maps that uh, the creek that is behind our house at one time went through our yard and then later they diverted it. So he knew that our lot could have some water problems, that it, we sit in a valley, that it could um, have a higher water table. And so he made plans to accommodate for this. First off, he built our lot up two extra feet uh, so that it would just have a little more height. And then he dug the foundation, dug for the basement out another two feet and put two extra feet of chat, which is what goes down first. And then the concrete for the floor and the foundations goes down next. And so he did this. It was kind of a new design. In fact, even folks from the city engineering department came to see what he had done because it was pretty clever. And I'm very pleased to say that because of his his great job, 24 years later, we've never had water in our basement. And a number of our neighbors have struggled with that, but we never have because it was a great, great foundation that was laid. Um, and, and so I'm very grateful for that. And you know, the reality of foundation, every house has one, whether you have a basement or not, um, is, that, is that the scriptures often speak metaphorically and allegorically of the, our lives and the foundations of our lives and how very important they are. Uh, we are all building on a foundation of one kind or another. In, uh, in this passage today, Paul, after he gives some instructions, first to those who want to get rich and then to those who are, uh, tells Timothy that if you will teach this and if people will put this into practice, he says, in this way, uh, your congregants will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. And in saying that, he was merely building on what Jesus taught in the Sermon on the Mount, what he said, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where moths and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. And so um, when we put the teachings of Jesus into effect, we are building on a very strong foundation. And um, one of the ways we live it out and why we're talking about it at this season is that it's this foundation that we want to build on during the season of Advent and Christmas. Um, as we move towards our Christmas Eve offering, as we give towards those who have need for food and for water. And Paul says, as we do this, we lay this great foundation. And he, he lays out the different elements in the two readings. Last week's, if you weren't with us, you might want to go check out that message. And then in this week, uh, four different ingredients. First, there's simplicity, being able to live on less. There's gratitude, being grateful for what you have. There's contentment, being okay with what you've got. And then generosity, being generous with what has been given to you. 
And what he's saying here, in, in ways that we don't really fully understand, is that the foundation we lay here prepares us for life there. The foundation we lay here prepares us in ways we don't fully understand for life there. Now, um, he's going to, like I said, last week he spoke to those who wanted to get rich. Now he's going to speak to those who are rich. And in so doing, he first kind of, he starts out with the negatives. He said there's a downside to wealth. And then he's going to turn back around and he's going to talk about the upside of wealth. So let's, let's look at uh, verse, um, uh, verse 17 here. Paul says, command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant. So the first thing he says to those who have money and resources is don't be proud. Don't be haughty. We know, you've experienced it, we all know that having nice things can, doesn't necessarily mean we will, but it can make us feel superior to those who don't have as nice of things. So if you have a nice car and you pull up to somebody who is driving an old beat up car, you could find yourself looking down your nose at the person with the beat up car. Same with clothing. Your clothing might be nice. Someone else might be dressed rather shabbily. You could look down upon them or the house you live in or the neighborhood that you live in. The reality is, if we're not careful, wealth can make us arrogant. And he says there's no reason to be arrogant. Why? Everything we have has been given to us by God. Then he say we brought nothing into the world. We'll take nothing out. God owns it all. Came from him. It goes back to him. You say, well, wait a minute, I worked hard for this. Yes, you did, and that's great. But who gave you the physical strength to work hard? Who gave you the mental acuity for the profession that you have? Who allowed you to be born in the United States of America? That's a gift. It's all a gift. Everything you have, everything I have is a gift from God. So he says, don't be arrogant about it, it's a gift. And then, so false pride is a downside of wealth. And then he, then he goes on to the next thing. He says, uh, teach them not to, to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God. Another downside of wealth is that uh, it, it creates false hope. Now, he said last week, he said, for we have brought nothing into the world and we take nothing out of it. I said, life is a journey between two moments of nakedness. Uh, not only is it true that you can't take it with you, it's also true, friends, that you may not keep what you have for the rest of your life. Life is uncertain. Now, um, more of us have trouble really believing what I just said because it's been 80 years since there's been a Great Depression. My grandfather had a reference. You know, I've heard me say many times, the banks failed, lost everything. Lost all of his savings. A lot of people did in the Great Depression. Um, right now, I would say the people may feel Kentucky. Have you seen the footage? Oh my gosh, how their lives have changed overnight. He says, life is so uncertain. It's here today and then be gone tomorrow. Your home, your money, your health. He said, so, so don't put your hope in it, um, it, it because, because it's, it's uncertain. Instead, put your hope in God. And what he's saying there is that putting your hope in wealth can undermine your hope in God. They are competitors, you know. That's why Jesus addressed the subject often. He said, you can't love money and God. He says, you can't serve two masters. He says, you'll either want, love one and hate the other. You'll despise one and, and serve the other. You cannot serve God and money, Jesus says. Now, we think we can, but he says, you can't. And so, hope in wealth undermines your hope in God. He said, put your hope in God because God's love is, is sure and certain his mercies are new every morning, and his love prevails and continues. So the downside is false hope and false pride. And then he goes on to say, he says, put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Lest you think Paul is laying out some kind of dour, austere life where we just, you know, never have anything nice or never eat any good food or don't have any good possessions, and we're just supposed to be miserable. He, he's not saying that. He says, God provides you with things for your enjoyment. It's, it's, it's good to enjoy the things. God created it. He created this world for us to enjoy. The very first commandment, we think the very first commandment was thou shalt not eat from that tree. First he says, eat from all of the trees here. We were commanded to eat and enjoy. Um, 
Next, next month, we'll begin the year with 21 days of prayer and fasting. It's always a time of spiritual power. Something happens when we combine prayer and fasting, and Jesus fasted, and he expects us to fast. But interestingly, do you know that the Bible prescribes more feasts than fast? There's a lot of feasts provided in, uh, prescribed in the scriptures. There is a time, friends, to eat really good food and lots of it. There's a time to celebrate the goodness of life and eat. Christmas is coming up, and I don't know about you, but I'm going to eat a lot of food, a lot of good stuff. Um, and, and it's time to feast and to celebrate the goodness of God. You see, some will, some overreact, and you can see this in church history all the time. They respond to the excessive materialism, and especially in our season, and they'll swing the pendulum all the way over to the other thing and, and head towards what's called asceticism. Asceticism means that you deprive yourself and you go without and, and you even treat, you, you treat your body st- severely so that you, you know, don't enjoy anything, I guess, because um, you're trying to react against that. That's not the Christian message. We can enjoy the, the, the things God has provided. We just, we just can't be arrogant about it and, and we don't want to put our hope in it. So that, that's the downside. Then he comes along and he talks about the upside of wealth. Um, so, so in verse 18, he says, command them to do good. But first of all, he says, command those who are rich in this present world. That's where he picks up. So remember, last week he's talked to those who wanted to get rich, and now he's talking to those who uh, are rich. Now, I, I'm going to guess, just going to guess. Sometimes we listen to sermons at the point of somebody else's need. Have you ever noticed that? You know, uh, I'm going to guess that some of you heard that. You say, whew, I'm glad the sermon's not for me today, but I'm sure glad that wealthy, wealthy person is here today because they really need to hear this. <laughs> huh? Come on, just admit it. A couple of you did. And so, so what, 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 what depends on how you define wealth? I know every culture, it's relative, right? What is wealthy in America is different from what's wealthy in Central America or Africa or Asia or whatever. But here's the reality. There is this great big world, and we have a lot of information on it. For instance, do you know that in Cape Girardeau, the median household income, meaning everybody in the house who works, put it all together, $53,732 in Cape Girardeau County. That's what it is. You compare that to the whole world. Now, in America, you're $53,000. That's a good salary. It's not, it's not what you would say wealthy. But do you realize that that puts you, if that's your household income, that puts you in the top 7%? Of all people in the world? Yeah. Put another way, if you make $53,000 a year, you make more than 93% of the world's population. So I kind of think he's talking to all of us here. I kind of think when, he, when he's addressing the wealthy, he's talking to all of us. All right? So now you can come back in the message. Okay, don't, don't, don't tune out. Come on back in. It's for everybody. So he's going to talk about the upside. Verse 18. Command them to do good to be rich in good deeds. Um, what is he saying here? He's saying develop a sense of responsibility. Jesus said it this way in Luke. He said, from everyone who has been given much, much will be demanded. And from the one who has been entrusted with much, much more will be asked. Or I like the old King James, to whom much is given, much is required. Now, what do we have as the world's wealthy? Well, for one thing, we have a particular kind of time that most people in the world, quite frankly, don't have much of. We have a particular kind of time that, quite frankly, most people in world history didn't have much of. What is it? It's discretionary time. It's called leisure time. You and I... As Americans today in this incredible country and economy in which we live have the luxury of having hours, lots of hours, during the week that we can structure and do whatever we want to. Unlike my grandfather's generation, who he was a coal miner, he worked 12 hours a day, six days a week, you know, uh, they didn't have much leisure time. They didn't have much discretionary time. And so he's saying here, what do we do with that? Well, what are you going to fill that discretionary time with? He's saying, be responsible with this. Teach them to do good, to be rich in good deeds. Now, let me share a word with my fellow baby boomers, all right? Because we are experiencing something that, quite frankly, no generation in American history has ever experienced, all right? 
And it's this. We are able to retire and we'll have more years in retirement than any generation in American history has ever had. And uh, because the stock market's doing well, 401ks are nicely, you know, uh, filled, people are retiring earlier than ever before. In fact, do you know when Social Security was developed back in the 1930s, the retirement age was set at 65. Do you know that back then the average life expectancy of an American male was 67? So you work all your life, all your life, and you get two years to enjoy it all. That's how it was. Today, retirement age is 65 or earlier for some, and the typical American male lives to be about 77 and women about 80. So we have a whole lot more time. Maybe as much as 25% of your life will be spent in retirement. So, baby boomers, what are you going to do with that time? Too much is given. Much is required. Paul says, do good and be rich in good deeds. And, and, I, and when I see that, I, and I see it often, and I see folks um, really being good stewards of their time and using their retirement years to serve See, the upside of, of having discretionary time is that you can serve. And, and this is by no means an exhaustive list, but I just made a list yesterday, yesterday the day before, about um, uh, some of the things that I see people doing who are retired. They do prison ministry. Now we have other folks who do prison ministry who aren't retired as well. Mentoring uh, Ignite students, mentoring young adults. You know, one of the things about millennial generation is that they are the generation that has craved mentoring by older adults more than any generation before it. Frenchie had an opportunity to build into the next generation. Uh, counseling premarital couples, getting them ready for marriage, student ministry. What one retired friend of mine just retired this year and started volunteering on Wednesday nights in student ministry, meals ministry, yeah, cooking and blessing families who've just uh, suffered the death of a loved one, quilting our quilting ministry. They were uh, down the hall this past week and putting together all kinds of lovely quilts that they give away to people who are hurting. Um, confirmation mentors, disaster relief. We have a Incredible ministry, disaster relief, guys with chainsaws, and they go out and do wonderful things with those chainsaws. They're going to be needed big time in Kentucky in the next few weeks. Now, not all the guys are retired that do that. Some take vacation time and go and serve. But some of you, maybe that's a way that you could get involved. There's, those are just, I've mentioned those ministries inside the walls through the church. There's all kinds of ministries and opportunities outside the walls, like our partners in town, vo volunteering at hospitals and libraries and and uh, being a volunteer at school, teachers would love that. Working in the Salvation Army. Being the first to respond to neighbors in need. Mowing their lawn when they, uh, you know, are in the hospital. Doing random acts of kindness. And I, I, I don't know what it is, fellow baby boomers, that you should be doing when you retire. I can't tell you what that is. God has a call for you and God has things for you to do. That's for you to figure out. But I can tell you, my hope and aspiration is that you'll do good and be rich in good deeds. And that your retirement years aren't just about improving your backhand or lowering your golf handicap or collecting wonderful seashells by the seashore. Because if that's all it is, that'd be a waste. Too much is given. Much is required. See, the upside of wealth is that you have time to serve. You ever heard the phrase, the idle rich? You ever heard that phrase? Yeah? It's a phrase because it's a thing. Paul says, in essence here, your wealth can make us lazy. So he's saying, teach them to do good, to be rich in good deeds. What we do is we lay this foundation, and it's beautiful when you see it done. And then he goes on and he says this, command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. Be generous. That's the upside of wealth, is that God can use what you have to bless others in very significant ways. And the reason we chose to talk, talk about this now is um, because of the Christmas Eve offering coming up. And there are many ways you can give, but this is one that has become special to us over the past 12 years. And our challenge has always been for every dollar you spend on Christmas gifts, and yes, enjoy your Christmas gift, put a dollar in the offering on Christmas Eve. And um, we're going through the series now because realize, look back, and, 
as we started this in 2009, first couple, three years, we did some preaching around this to kind of give the why. Why are we doing this on Christmas Eve? You know, it's been 10 years since we actually did a full series on this subject and talked about the why with this kind of depth. But this is why. This is why we do a Christmas Eve offering because we are the wealthy of the world and the Lord calls us to be generous and willing to share. Let me tell you, friends, your giving is making a huge difference. Last week, 1,300 plus volunteers gathered at the Osage Center and packed meals for Feed My Starving Children, and we wound up packing 420,583 meals. And that, the best number, is 1,152. That's how many children are going to have a meal every day for the next year because of your generosity. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Kids are going to be able to stay in school. They're going to be able to concentrate because their belly's going to be full. And their future is going to be brighter because of that. Kenny and Amber can tell you stories about distributing Feed My Starving Children at Project Canaan where they, where they serve. They've seen it in action. So thank you. And then we take the rest, which probably be 50% or so of the offering, and we dig wells in Mozambique, Africa. We've been doing that also for 12 years. And tens of thousands of people literally now have access to safe, fresh, clean drinking water. And that's a gift that keeps on giving and giving and giving. In fact, we just got a, a letter not long ago from a, uh, a, a member of a church at the little village of Makule in Mozambique because they just had a well. And here they are at the dedication of the well. And they're praising God and celebrating and taking time to worship because now for the first time, this little village has access to clean drinking water because of you and the offering received last year. And one of the members of the church, a woman by the name of Cesarina Raphael, uh, wrote us this letter. And she wrote this to you. Listen to what she said. Because it's been many years that this community was lacking water. Uh, waterborne diseases broke through in the area. And sadly, we lost our relatives due to malaria, diarrhea, and cholera. We walked long distances uh, to the scarce existing water sources. The average African will walk four miles to fetch water. Uh, she says, adding the physical wear, reduced time to attend church and school programs. During this time, women, pregnant women, elderly people, and children woke up at 5 a.m. and walked long distances to find water, and when they got there, long lines. Because apart from stagnating economic activities in our communities, it was even scary if the water sources happened to be contaminated since cattle and other animals drank from the same source. I don't know about you but I've never drank water out of a, 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 a well, that, a, a water source that cows were drinking from, nor do I have any desire to do so. They do. But now the well was dug because I'm very lucky to be so close to this source of water. With the support of our Missouri partners and through provision of clean water, we've been transformed. We no longer carry heavy buckets. We have sufficient time for our domestic activities. And she quotes John 15. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. With the advent of COVID-19, access to water has helped reduce contaminations once we're able to wash hands and use water for other purposes. She goes, on behalf of the Macule community, we thank God for having been given this gift of water which we never dreamed possible. Thanks for sharing resources with our people as a demonstration of great love to your fellow sisters and brothers in need. May our Lord and lovely Jesus continue to bless all of you. And we promise to maintain the well and pray for your families and the church in general. So here's this, this sweet family, this congregation. They're praying for us. They're praying for you today. And they're giving thanks to God because now they won't get sick when they drink that water again. They'll be healthy. You see, Wealth can do wonderful things. It can do great good in the world. And so Paul says, teach them to be generous, willing to share. And that generosity will make a difference. And then he again says this verse, he says, um, in this way, they will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age so that they may take hold of life that is life indeed. The Passion Translation says, these spiritual investments will provide a beautiful foundation for their lives and secure for them a great future as they lay hands upon the meaning of true life. Now, he's not saying you somehow buy your salvation. He's not saying you earn your salvation. He, what he's saying is, as you do this, you're living into your salvation. N.T. Wright says, we are commanded to live our lives in accordance with the new world we have already entered by faith. One day, we will see how that has prepared and shaped us for the new world. 
this foundation that we lay, this foundation that Jesus spoke about as he concluded the Sermon on the Mount. He gave this parable. You've heard these words before. He said, therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, but it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. You see, the materials we use for our foundation really do matter. It can withstand the toughest, toughest of storms, and it can come crumbling down, Jesus says. So in this whole passage, he's, he's really been showing us the building materials. You've got to look at them side by side. You can compare them. First, on the left side, there's materialism, living for more and more stuff. Asceticism is that thing where I talked about, you know, being, you know, uh, depriving yourself of everything and thinking that's spiritual. Uh, and then coveting, wanting more, and, and selfishness. That's a foundation that crumbles. And then on the other side are beautiful building materials. Simplicity, choosing to live on less. Gratitude, being grateful for what you have. Contentment, being okay with where you're at. And generosity, giving richly and generously. Not just Christmas Eve, but all throughout the year. So the question is, what building materials are you using to build your life? thing is, you will lay a foundation for the coming age. I don't understand all that means. I just know that there's a connection somehow because Jesus says it, Paul says it. But I do know this, you also leave a legacy right now going into the future. Let me tell you about a, a legacy that was started 260 years ago. The year was 1761. And John Wesley, the founder of Methodism, was invited to preach at St. Patrick's Cathedral in Dublin, Ireland. St. Patrick's is one of Ireland's most majestic cathedrals. Wesley didn't often get invited to preach in places like this. And so he went there with an expectation, and he went there knowing that he had a responsibility. So he preached from 1 Timothy chapter 6. All right? And, and um, he knew that the city's most successful, comfortable, and perhaps self uh, Self-satisfied people would be there. And so he went locked and loaded, let me tell you. He thundered against self-centeredness, disregard for the poor. Later, he wrote in his journal about preaching at St. Patrick's. He says, oh, who has courage to speak plain to these rich and honorable sinners? Wesley didn't pull any punches. Rich and honorable sinners. Hmm. Well, in the congregation that day was a young businessman who had just started a company and was beginning to develop a reputation for being pretty good at brewing beer. He was a uh, devoted follower of Christ. He was a Methodist. And as he listened to Wesley talk about our God-given responsibility to be uh, generous with what we have, he decided then and there in that service that he was going to build his company on a different kind of foundation that he was going to build his company on excellence in brewing so that they could take the wealth that they had and be a blessing to the world around them. That young man was Arthur Guinness, the founder of the, uh, the Guinness Brewing Company. And oh my, when you read this story, it is just simply a remarkable story. Um, the, the Guinness brand is known around the world and his... Uh, uh, dark stout is loved by uh, many around the world to this day. But Guinness decided to build a company that um, had a vision, had a vision for producing wealth to bless those in need, to serve the downtrodden and the poor. He began to think differently about wealth and his company. Um, he funded the first Sunday schools. The, the Methodists were the first to start Sunday school, but get out of your mind what you think Sunday school is. It's not how we do Sunday school. Sunday school in those days was a, was a literacy program because children, like my grandfather dropped out of school in second grade to work in the mines because he had to. His family was starving. He didn't get an education. Kids in, in, in Ireland then, they didn't get an education. They couldn't read, which didn't give them a lot of future. 
And so Methodists started Sunday schools, and in Sunday school, they taught them how to read. There were literacy programs, and guess what they used as their textbook? The Bible. They taught them how to read. They taught them about Jesus. And uh, so, he, so Arthur Guinness started the first Sunday schools. He founded the first hospitals for the poor. He positioned his company to transform lives. And when he died in 1803, the Dublin Evening Post declared that Arthur Guinness' life was useful and benevolent and virtuous. Um, but it didn't just stop with him. His heirs continued the tradition. One of his heirs in the mid-1800s, upon getting married as a young man in his 20s, was given millions of dollars as heir to the company's fortune. He promptly took his young bride and moved to the slums so that they might never forget the plight of the poor and that their lives might be reminded of the needs of the hurting around them. Um, the Guinness Company um, funded missionaries. They, um, they came to the aid of the Irish during the terrible days of the potato famine. Some of you are from Irish descent, and I suspect that, that some of your, your uh, forebears came to America because they were starving in Ireland. They were dying, and they came to America to eat. And the Guinness Company emptied their coffers and fed the hungry. Today, you will find statues in honor of the Guinness Company all throughout Ireland because of their extravagant generosity. The Guinness Company was the very first company that set up a pension plan for their workers and their spouses, unheard of in that day, decades and decades before any other company even dreamed of it. They provided health care for their workers. Again, unbelievable. They decided they would treat their workers the very best and, and, and show them extravagant generosity. And to this day, the company does that. Do you know that they are very involved also in digging wells in Africa and using the wealth that God has given them to bless others. They especially focus in America on firefighters and blessing them. On and on, 260 years later, because Arthur Guinness heard a sermon on 1 Timothy 6 and decided he was going to build a different kind of company. You may never build a company. You may never have access to millions, but you do have the wealth that you have. And you can choose what to do with that. And if you build a life on contentment and generosity and um, the goodness of God, you will leave a legacy that your children and grandchildren and their children will follow and will bless into the future and into the next life. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for um, the witness of those who have gone before us and shown us a better way, a different way. We thank you for those who have left wonderful foundations for us to build on. We thank you for the wonderful good being done in our own community. What a remarkably generous community we live in. And what and how inspiring that is. I thank you for the many examples. And I thank you for the, the beautiful foundation that we can lay um, the foundation that you instruct us to lay in Scripture. And so God, help us to be good stewards of the time that we have and of the financial resources that we've been given. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you are the cornerstone of this building, our lives, and that uh, all we have is a gift from you. I thank you that we get to partner with you to do good in this world. For we pray in the name of Jesus, who is God's gift to us. Amen. Let's all stand and let's, uh, let's sing this Christmas song. If you enjoyed today's message, make sure to like and subscribe. Feel free to share this with others that God has put on your heart. And to learn more about LaCroix Church or to find your next steps, head to LaCroixChurch.org. Thanks again for checking us out, and we hope to see you soon.